It's all changed again, but not everyone's too happy. Let's get started. Another race for the world's greatest driver, Juan Manuel Fangio. Former world champion Jim Clark leapt into the lead. That's Clark's Lotus going like a bomb. And James Hunt is the world champion by just one single point. By being a racing driver, you are under risk all the time. And if you no longer go for a gap that exists, you're no longer a racing driver. And that is Michael Schumacher ahead, the world champion. To become a four-time world champion, Sebastian Vettel, Lewis Hamilton, champion of the world. That's for all the kids out there who dream the impossible. Max Verstappen, for the first time ever, is champion of the world. Yes! Hello and welcome to episode 18 of F1 in Review, the episode, the hour and part two of where we look back at round nine of this season, the Canadian Grand Prix. Hello, I'm Tom Claibon and I'm back and I'm joined by Tristan Fancourt and thank you so much to Tristan and Angus for holding the fort so well last week and episode. A reminder, you can uh, follow myself and Tristan individually on Twitter as well as F1 in Review, we have our own account there for those who don't know. And while there's a break between the Canadian Grand Prix and round 10 being Silverstone, the British Grand Prix, Paul Passing has dominated the headlines, particularly after Baku and before Montreal, actually. The FIA have issued a technical directive, for those who don't know, to all teams to tackle Paul Passing, they say, in the interest of safety, saying that excessive fatigue and pain experienced by drivers could have significant consequences and could result in loss of uh, concentration and, at times, consciousness. They say that acting on the interests and the advice of the doctors of the FIA and Formula One more generally. So... What are they doing to tackle the issue? Well, it still remains pretty vague, but number one, they're looking at vertical acceleration. So for those who don't know, that's basically porpoising, bouncing. They're going to be monitoring that with specific instruments in the cars and to define a safe area of operation with the help of the teams. That's part one. Part two is they're going to be monitoring the uh, planks and skids on the bottom of the car to monitor for excessive wear and to look at the overall design. They're then going to go and set out safe limitations for a car setup, so a constructor will have to go and create something within the limits the FIA do eventually create, lock that in at the end of Final Practice 3, and if anything changes to this, the constructor will then have to go and prove to the FIA that they're still operating safely within the limits. With me so far... Thank you very much. Uh, in terms of the car setup, if it's not deemed safe within the FIA's perimeters, they'll then be asked to raise the car's rear heights by 10 millimeters, so then they can race. And it's understood this will all come into force at the Silverstone Grand Prix, the next one coming up starting on Friday. And now the reaction, of course, has of course been quite divided. George Russell saying it's a sticking plaster more than a solution. Red Bull and Ferrari say it's wrong to issue this directive in the middle of the season and that it punishes those who aren't suffering from porpoising that damages the overall performance of the car. Meanwhile, Toto Wolff, who's the team principal of Mercedes, says it's pitiful and disingenuous from Red Bull and Ferrari to uh, not act more strongly when it comes to this. So, in conclusion, those who are suffering with poor performance driven by porpoising are more happy with what the FA are doing, but not totally happy. Those whose performances are unaffected by porpoising, the, the aforementioned Red Bull and Ferrari are anything but happy, but no one's truly happy with uh, what the FA have done so far. But Tristan, what do you make of this large, vague and to-be-defined technical directive by the FAA in the middle of the season? Well, I think the problem is the FIA are stuck between a rock and a hard place when it comes to this one because whatever they do, it's going to make someone unhappy. And to some extent, this is the FIA responding in the very, very immediate short term to a, a problem that no one really envisaged at the beginning of the season. And, I mean, nine races on, we have a problem that's recurring and that we don't really get that in F1 unless it's something very, very serious, okay? Because most of the time with aerodynamic problems, you can you can basically engineer them out of the car quite easily. Or even, in the case of Aston Martin, re-engineer yourself a new car. 
It'll be interesting to see what they do at, at Silverstone. Apparently, there's more stuff coming. So that's a good example of how you can change the, the car quite dramatically but after nine races to basically remove all the you know, fundamental problems that you might have discovered through you know, each each session of testing and practicing and even the races. But we're in a weird situation that because of the mandated design of the cars and the emphasis on ground effect, we're going to have porpoising here to stay. And some teams have, with different design ethoses have managed to engineer a car that is fast and doesn't porpoise. Now, we'll never know this for sure because, you know, Tom and I don't have access to the technical directives or, or um, plans of each team. But I think it's relatively safe to say that the Mercedes car on paper is probably the most effective design when it comes to the aerodynamic performance, which is probably why it porpoises so much, because it has that massive floor of the car that produces a huge amount of, of, of suction power as it goes fast, which means that the porpoising is exacerbated because everything is emphasised because Mercedes poured everything into having that big you know, underfloor um, um, crate the majority of the downfalls are a huge amount of the downfalls. Whereas Red Bull and Ferrari and Red Bull especially actually have gone for a completely different design, which on, you know, not on paper is as fast, but in practice is um, faster than the Mercedes in reality. You know, this reminds me, Tom, of a, of a really good phrase, which is in theory, in theory and in practice are the same. In practice, in theory and in practice are very different. And it seems like the Mercedes one, in theory, is going to be faster, but in practice, it's just not. And so the FIA, as I say, are stuck between a rock and a hard place. They can appease Mercedes by saying, fine, we're bringing back active suspension or we're bringing back um, the option to create downforce in other ways or, or whatever it might be. Or they can really annoy Mercedes and maybe other teams as well that have porpoising problems and say, well, it's your own fault for designing a car that bounces like a pogo stick, you know, <laughs> rename it the W space hopper, not the, the W 13, you know, that's, and, mm. and as a result, you're going to have to just deal with the fact that your car might damage your driver. And it really did damage Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. Which is, is awful. You know, we shouldn't mm -hmm. be in a situation where a driver is struggling to get out of the car afterwards. Um, because it, it's it's hurting them. So the FIA, I felt, has actually just met, met everyone in the middle of it. And has turned around and said, well, we can't give you a reason or we can't give you a way to stop the porpoising because that would be too interventionalist. But equally, we have to intervene to some extent. So all they've said is it just can't porpoise too much. Mm. And I feel like that's pretty fair because that's in line with the way that we've had to deal with things like tyre pressures. In F1, you have a band of tyre pressures you can run the tyres at. There's a minimum and a maximum. The advantage yep. of low tyre pressure is you get a nice squidgy tyre, which allows you to accelerate really, really quickly because there's a lot of tyre touching the ground, which is great, especially as these are slicks. But the downside is they, they wear out faster. Very, very pumped up tyres will last longer. But of course, you don't get that nice squidgy effect. So they run in a band. So teams can pick what pressure they want in a, in a select region. And this is very similar. Teams can decide to have you know a car that maybe is slightly more ground effect um, heavy with a nice big floor. But they've got to make sure that that's within a safety band of porpoising. So I don't think that's all that silly. I think the thing is, Tom, that all teams are just going to complain about whatever they say. Yes.
No, I think you're right there. I think porpoising, owing to the overall designs and the regulations that cars have to go and fit within, we've not seen in 40, 50 years. I think the last time we saw porpoising of any kind was the 70s and 80s. And obviously no one realised it would be an issue until the cars took to the track and some designs meant there was no damage in terms of performance owing to porpoising and others were severely damaged. But... The FIA couldn't do nothing, could they, at this point? I understand that there's some concerns from Red Bull and Ferrari that they didn't want them to intervene at this point in time because it's the middle of the season. I sympathise with the origins of that thought, but when you've literally got drivers... Sorry. When you've literally got doctors of Formula 1 saying this currently isn't safe, there's a strong possibility that drivers could lose concentration and consciousness. There's blurred vision in the short term and longer term. You can't not do anything as the stewards of the sport, the umpires of the entire game. We've seen in other sports, NFL for example, how many micro-concussions can have a severe effect on people's ability in the sport and out of the sport when they go untreated and not really looked at. So I don't really understand or I don't really hold too much sympathy towards the overall argument of Alpha Tauri, of Red Bull, of Ferrari to an extent of essentially drivers need to man up because mm. a Formula One car is never going to be a Rolls Royce. I understand it's not going to be, you know, all lovely roses and soft fluffy clouds, but then again, when you've got someone like Lewis Hamilton literally having to pull himself out of the car, every driver, bar one saying porpoising is a problem, you have to do something. And with this technical directive, it's obviously to be defined. I think it's excellent that the teams are going to be involved on this. It's not coming from the top down. It's very much, you know, being brought in in terms of uh, team involvement as well, which I think is really good. And I think it's also good that if a team does violate the new parameters to be set, they won't be disqualified or banned. They'll just have to go and raise up their car's rear ride height. Meaning, ultimately, that they can still race, but they'll be somewhat hampered for, let's say, cutting corners in many ways ways and as you say Mercedes are a victim of their own design here they're the ones who suffer the most from this because they have to run their cars as low down as possible to get the best effect from it so I don't really necessarily look at Toto Wolf's argument and go and say like oh we've got to go and fix this because this has come out of nowhere not necessarily true when you consider that the design was a gamble in many ways and for once with Mercedes it hasn't it hasn't come off so I look forward to what's going to come from a more defined version of these regulations from the FIA, the technical directive. But I think it's a very good start, really, because it doesn't do too much, it doesn't do too little, but it does show that when they need to intervene, they're not going to be stopped from doing so from various different forces. Is this just a short-term measure, though? And, and if so, where does the FIA take it with these regulations, given we don't necessarily in the sport want too much intervention from the f you know the fia and formula one management but also don't forget this is a sport called formula one it comes Mm. from the fact that there is a distinct and very well defined formula so there is always going to be that intervention because you know Mm. within his historically speaking things like active suspension were part of the sport I mean, I'm, I'm just going to drop this in there because then I can lovely segue to the fact that I was at Goodwood this weekend, um, <laughs> uh, which was that the, the FW14B, the Frank Williams 14B, was a was an F1 car that had, in the 90s, active suspension. And they actually demonstrated the active suspension at Goodwood, which was really cool to see. And weird to see them, like, yeah, weird to see as well because we, we you know, expect them to have passive suspension. But that car there at Goodwood, which I was at. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Say it again. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know Tom was at Goodwood? It's brilliant. Um, Were you? Oh, wow. I was actually. Um, <laughs> yeah, had active suspension. So do, do you think the, F, the FIA could bring that back and maybe under the guise of modernising the sport? I think you could see some minor tweaks to the regulations moving forwards or at least some extended parameters to make sure we don't see, I suppose, a situation where a constructor can design a car which, not by design, ultimately hurts their drivers to get the best out of the car's performance, if that makes sense. I wouldn't rule out active suspension. I do feel that this is obviously a short-term measure um, because it's still very vague, it's still unclear how and when this is going to be properly enacted into the sport. But 
I think I think you've you've got to see some change, haven't you? Really, in terms of that, because the risk is we just see a repeat of this every season. And then a short-term measure is put in, and then we go back to square one and go, well, every constructor's learned their lesson, and then someone tries something, and then it doesn't go well, and we have the same sort of circular argument going on. So I can't see a total binning of the new regulations, because I think aside from porpoising, you've seen how good it has been for the sport. You've seen really a really packed midfield. It's not really too clear who's the bottom team, i.e. the worst, and who's the best, because it's that close. Obviously, it's not going to be a situation where you have Williams in first one weekend and Red Bull down the bottom and then roll reversal on different circuits there's always going to be some structure some hierarchy but um I think in yeah in, in the winter time you will see a change but I wouldn't see a radical overhaul inbound and I don't think there should be either really is there a danger that by not giving the teams options to curb problems such as porpoising it's effectively going to force all manufacturers to go down a very specific route when it comes to designing their cars for next year. Because mm-hmm. if I was Mercedes, I'd cut my losses if they can't get it fixed after 18, 19 races. Because I've been thinking, well, surely then it, the best option is going to be for either Ferrari or Red Bull. But if Red Bull, for example, is so much quicker or the Ferrari is so much quicker, everyone's just going to pile down that bandwagon. And next year, we're just going to see five different versions of the same car. We've already Mm. seen that sort of by the fact that Aston Martin has just redesigned their car to look like Red Bull. Yeah. I think I do think that's a real concern. Um, I suppose it depends how strong and how effective this technical directive is in terms of whether it offers more guidance in terms of we well, could do this, you could do that, or a more straight dra- jacket approach when it comes to porpoising. I mean, do you think you could see that? Because we've seen it already. We do tend to see it, I suppose, when there's a new uh, regulatory change. You see initially the cards are all thrown up in the air and then everyone's scrambling to which design will be best and then and eventually the dust settles and everyone realises the best formula to get the best car. But are you of the opinion we could see a situation where Aston Martin do what they've done and follow the leader and then everyone gets into a bit of a pattern? Well, to some extent, that's always uh, always happens. And it's weird to be, my own question to be thrown back at me. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, to some extent, that always happens because if you, if you hark back to a, a different era, Right when um, the double diffuser came into the sport, um, mm. and it was so powerful in Formula One that Jensen Button, basically in that two thousand and nine season, got a massive head start over other teams, and then other teams all jumped onto the bandwagon, opted in for that that double diffuser. But his head start was large enough that by the end of this season, you know, he he managed to win it. Which um, it was estimated that it was about 0.3 of a second, by the way, the 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 increase in speed from having the double diffuser on the back of that brawn F1 car. Um, So if you look at that, uh, that example, you know, that that every team is going to pick up an optimum spec if you'd like, and, and go, wow, that's a great idea. We probably should have done that, which probably explains why the FIA got rid of DAS when mm. the Mercedes F1 car had that system where they could point the tyres dead straight and then point them slightly more towards each other. If you don't know, dead straight gives you top speed and then having them slightly pointed towards each other will uh, increase your cornering efficiency. And basically, Mercedes found a way that in the in the regulations by making the drivers pull back or forward on the steering wheel to make their tyres point straight or slightly towards each other. And so that was ruled out immediately by the F- F- um, FIA after the season that um, Mercedes had it because they realised that everyone was going to do that. So, mm. yes, I think that everyone is going to go down a certain route. But if you think about the run-up to the end of the previous aerodynamic era when we had that culmination last year of Red Bull versus Mercedes, Mm. Red Bull did have a different design to Mercedes. Yeah. And they had been working on that 
for a number of years and going down you know the the their road and trying to optimize it and for a long time it they were held back by the fact that they had for example Renault engines that were unreliable and then Honda was getting right up to speed and finally there was this big crescendo which was brought mm. to us by the fact that there was two teams who had slightly d- different design ethoses that allowed them to be as fast as each other through optimization but because of the severity of porpoising because it will damage the drivers and because it makes you so much slower as in you know tenths two tenths three tenths of a second if you have to raise your ride height up then there's no point because you can't optimize that there is no way to fit you know to get the the porpoising to stop Mm. and toto has sort of said this as well you know he said that they didn't they you know he at one at some point he said you know oh yes we found a way to engineer it out and then in the next interview said oh yeah (laughs) um we haven't found a way around it yet and so yep. you, you know you can say to the the you know the media and your external image as much as you want and say oh yes it's um it's all fine we're going to engineer it out but you can't cheat physics yeah the only way you can do it is to have something like active suspension or you know active dampening so that you can remove that bouncing so you can force the car in in the in the, in the other other direction so it doesn't bottom out but I, to be honest, Tom, I, you know, to answer my own question, yes, I think that's what will happen. I think cars will go down a certain design route. Mm-hmm. And that is always going to happen a little bit. But there is supposed to be variation. There is supposed to be moments of magic when a team goes, do you know what? Because we've done this design, we can do this thing that allows us to get an extra tenth of a second in the corners where other teams go, look, we're way faster on the straights and that gives yep. everything some you know some more excitement it's it's annoying mm. if all the teams go down the same idea, you know same route because then you can pretty much guarantee that the green mercedes and the blue mercedes or the pink red bull and the regular red bull are going to perform exactly the same it's part mm. of the argument why we don't necessarily want b teams in the sport but yeah it, it, it is a looming threat at the moment so I think maybe it is time that we modernize the sport just a little bit and allow technology to enter in in a way that we all moved on from the idea of just pure petrol engines. I mean, there was such a difference at Goodwood Festival of Speed this weekend, which I was at, which um, <laughs> between the, the, like the old V12s, the V10s, and then the hybrid engines, which sounded just completely different, more whistly, more refined. And then the pure electric Formula E cars, which were, you know, very, very whiny, but were incredible in their own in their own way. They were the sound of the future. But we moved on from the idea of pure petrol to a mm. hybrid system. So maybe that's what we need, Tom. Maybe we need a hybrid system for the suspension in a new era of Formula One. Mm-hmm. And to add to that as well, we've seen changes when it comes to tyres, for example. You know, we've gone from the softs and the hards to the super softs and the whole variation. So, you know, Formula One can evolve and it can be fine. And ultimately, we look back and think, well, that shouldn't be introduced. Well, I'm not too sure about that. And then a few years on, things are exactly the same, if not better, in terms of quality. So I think, yeah, I think as we've seen with Formula One through the entirety of its history, technology has got to play a focal point really in advancing the sport and rooting out porpoising but I can't see as great as this technical directive is to bring in part way through the season it's not going to be solving any issues anytime soon really which I think that's really what Mercedes were anchoring for understandably and those on the other side of the spectrum were not really because while there is of course porpoising in every card to some aspect it doesn't necessarily hamper the performance uh, of all of them, really. And we're seeing as well that while porpoising can be a, a big issue, there's other issues as well which remain from the old the old days, if you will. Yeah. I mean, engine reliability, for example, hydraulic reliability, they're always going to be there. And there's those teams that really ha- are hampered from this and are damaged from it in some races and throughout seasons and those who aren't really. So maybe porpoising is just another sort of thing to add into the cold 
cauldron of things to master, things to watch out for, which we haven't really seen in 40, 50 years, but it's always, in some capacity, been in the sport when we go down this regulatory path. I guess what you summarised there was actually, you know, exactly spot, spot on. But I see this directive from the FIA not targeting cars, but actually targeting the safety of the driver. I yeah, think I they're pretty I agnostic when it comes to supporting or not supporting a particular design or porpoising. I think the only thing they're, they're, they're caring about when it comes to this particular um, ruling is they just want to protect the driver. And that means basically saying you can't keep slamming your driver's back into the tarmac, you know, with with eight or nine G's of impact per impact. And so from a safety perspective, I think it's done it's done its job. But it does seem to me a bit, Tom, that every time the FIA introduces a safety ruling, all the teams are a little bit against it. So maybe it's just mm. that old chestnut coming back and um, proving again that sometimes we do have to ignore the teams and the team's bosses to to get some safety progression mm. well i mean look at the halo for example i can't really name one team that was shouting from the rooftops so we've got to bring the halo in the halo is the future and now you can't find a team driver <laughs> anyone yeah. involved in formula one that says boo halo <laughs> for obvious reasons so trust the process eh? yeah exactly well, it's one thing to qualify well, and it's another thing to finish the race well, and no two constructors know this better than Alfa Romeo and Haas after the uh, Canadian Grand Prix just gone. It was a double points finish for Alfa Romeo, Bottas and Joe qualifying in 11th and 10th, but finishing in P7 and P8. The second time that Guan Yu Zhou has scored points in his debut season in Formula 1. And they sit 6th in the Constructors after, let's be fair, a pretty impressive start to the season and first 9 races at that. They're 24 points clear of Alpha Tauri, 6 away from Alpine who are above them in P5. What do we make of Alfa Romeo's start, their Canadian Grand Prix and we love posing this question, or should I say I do, could they catch Alpine? <laughs> Ah, uh, I don't necessarily think they're going to catch Alpine because Alpine has been quite strong and has itself suffered from, I think, more reliability issues, um, which has hampered its performance. Of course, that actually doesn't make a blind bit of difference, right? Because if you only if you finish the race a, a race once and get first and then fail to complete any other races, then you're still a rubbish team. You just happened, you know, to have got first place. I think I think they're going to be behind Alpine by the end of the season, but there's no doubt that this is a complete revival of Alfa Romeo compared to last year. I was actually thinking earlier today as I watched back um, the 2017 Azerbaijan Grand Prix. You might wonder why why I did that. Sometimes it's, <laughs> it's good to get uh, to remind yourself where teams were, especially when we come into this podcast. It's just part of the way we you know we do our prep um, and. Looking, looking at how far Alpha Alpha Romeo has actually come, and I was thinking, thinking about like Kimi Raikkonen and what what could have been um, if it was mm. Kimi Raikkonen and Valtteri Bottas. But then, actually, Guan Yu Zhou or Zhou Guan Yu has really knocked it out of the park, I'd say, for his rookie season. I mean, look, he's in sixteenth place at the moment with five points and you might think well he's only got five points but he's beating out alexander Al albon lance stroll mick schumacher and nico hulkenberg nick is i love the fact that nico hulkenberg is still by the way counted yeah. in the official uh f1 <laughs> standings because he had that you know one moment but it's true he's even Hul beating out hulkenberg and when we talk about a, a rookie season for a driver often we're not citing the great you know knockout seasons that we we've seen every so often in fact what we want is just solid performance and a demonstration that you can hold your own in f1 the ability to score points and the ability to show off every so often under good conditions why you've got your seat and this Alfa Romeo car, I think, is allowing both Bottas and 
Joe Grant you to show off really what they can do. I I do mm. think it's a, a shame that I, they're not going to beat Alpine because that would be a massive upset, I think, for, for Alpine, given that um, they've got a huge amount of backing. But if I'm brutally honest, th- as this season is all about reliability, I think, and uh, and luck, then six points could be easily made up. But I think I think what Al- uh, Alpha Romeo would need to to overtake Alpine is is basically two Bottas's because Bottas has got forty six points mm. compared to you know Joe's five points. So if Joe can pick it up a bit and take advantage of the opportunities that the the Alfa Romeo car and the speed that the Ferrari engine is giving them, then I think yes, they probably could beat Alpine. But it's his rookie season, Tom. And yep. you know, Bottas is an incredibly talented driver. I mean, as I say, the Azerbaijan Grand Prix in twenty seventeen, Bottas came went from last to P two. You mm. know, that is a driver that's done nearly the you know one of those all time great things where you go from last to first. You know, that's the caliber of driver that Lewis Hamilton is, for example. Yep. And yes, there has to be a little bit of luck in that, but you still have to be a talented driver. And Bottas really is a fantastic driver. He's shown time and time again this season, you know, and in only nine races, that he can absolutely hold his own, beating out Lewis Hamilton and George Russell in in you know, mm-hmm. in the in their Mercedes, demonstrating that he can play the game and and you know in races just hold his own and. Whilst others are fighting, he sort of creeps up behind <laughs> and uh, eventually <laughs> capitalizes on you know their problems and overtakes them. So I think Al- Alfa Romeo would need two Bottases. As I say, maybe Kimi Raikkonen, if he was still in the in the car, paired with Bottas, would there be in front of Alpine? But as it currently stands, I think Joe's got to settle in a little bit more before he can really pull the you know his weight and. Uh, give some of those knockout punches to the the teams to create surprise upsets but to be where they are at the moment is fantastic given last year that you know they were a back back of the field team mm-hmm. oh yeah last season for those who were listening to f1 in review in the last season of uh of formula in 2021 you would have heard me ranting and raving about how dead alfa romeo were as a team they just lacked a real spark they were so bland they'd kept the same drivers for i think going on three seasons and it showed just stale that was the word i used stale and i think they were very stale in terms of what they were doing and they deserved to be in ninth place where i believe they finished but this season like phoenix from the ashes doing so well aren't they and i'm really glad to see bottas has uh, decided to stay in formula one because i recently saw there was um rumors indeed he considered leaving formula one after he found out that uh he would no longer be with mercedes and george russell would be replacing him but i'm so glad at the age of 32 he decided to carry on and to go to a team like alfa romeo because he's now a big fish in a smaller pond and he's really showing his worth because whilst compared to Lewis Hamilton, I think we are all were semi-critical of him and going, oh, come on, Bottas, give him a bit more of a fight. Go after him a bit more, you know, play play dirty a bit more. Don't just um, sort of a, a, a adhere to the rules of Mercedes. But then again, compared to Lewis Hamilton, one of, if not the greatest drivers of all time, you're going to look pretty naff, aren't you, nine times out of ten? And now he's outside of the shadow and in a pretty competitive car, you see how good he is. But reliability, of course, is an issue, particularly for Alfa Romeo. I mean, look at Guan Yu Zhou, for example, down in P16. And if you were to look at that on a pure numbers basis, you go, hmm, that's not too good, is it really? But then you consider that he's not finished in three of the races out of the nine. So essentially, he's been finishing in two thirds of the races so far compared to everyone else. And when you consider that in those two thirds, he scored points, a P10 and a P8 most recently, you go, that's pretty good going for your first season in Formula 1, particularly when you consider that Mick Schumacher, we'll get onto him later, is yet to score a point, and he's been here for a season plus. 
you, the, you, of course, there were there were questions, there were queries and whispers about when Guan Yu Zhou was announced into Formula One. There were, of course, questions around why he was brought in. Of course, he has a lot of money that comes with him in terms of sponsorship, and people went, "Well, is he another Nikita Mazepin or a, um, a, a Nicholas Latifi?" But no, he's proving his worth on track as well. And of course, his money helps in terms of the development of the car. But they're doing really well, and I think if you were to go and say to Alfa Romeo at the start of the season, you'd be you'd be in P6, you'd be finishing in P6 when it comes to the constructors. I think they'd snap your hand off there, really, ahead of Alfa Tauri, Aston Martin and Haas, which do have good days, and be quite close to an Alpine car, which, of course, it does have some reliability issues, but one which could hold its own, really, at the uh, Grand Prix just gone. Uh, it shows really leaps and bounds for them, but... I think, yeah, to get past Alpine may be a bridge too far, really, but that's not for the want of trying, for sure. I mean, the thing about Alfa Romeo is they kind of did a Haas in 2021. They leaned up their production of the 2021 car and, and basically stripped back all the cash from it, You know, made it very, very lean and chucked all the money into this, this year's car. Which was a bit of a shame because last year was the last time Kimi Raikkonen was supposed to race in Formula 1. I don't think he will be back, but it's always sod's law that if you say, that's the last time Kimi Raikkonen was in the sport, you know, he mm. will never to be back in a week's time just to demonstrate how silly we are to make predictions. And, but it was you know the last car that Kimi Raikkonen supposedly is going to be racing in Formula 1. And it was a bit rubbish. And I, to be fair, I know you don't particularly care all that much for Antonio Giovinazzi. How could you tell? <laughs> because I spoke to you throughout the whole 2020 and 2021 <laughs> season, Tom. You know, it, Aside it, from that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know you're not his number one fan. Maybe top ten. I think that's fair. Um, that's fair. You know, he, I do feel like it didn't help him to be in a car that was particularly poor. Although... Antonio Giovinazzi fans, he he might well be back. So watch the mm. space in Haas, actually. But that paid dividends, them stripping back all the cash and putting all the resources into this year. Because what they produced is a is a fantastic car, which is having more reliability issues due to Ferrari than it is due to their own engineering prowess and, and their parts. And I don't know what they told Bottas, and it, it may be all the right stuff, but you know he timed it so well to go to Alfa Romeo. A proper change for a chance to help de- you know, really deliver good results for the Alfa Romeo Sauber team. And don't forget, he is engineered by Sauber, who are a proper engineering team that have been in Formula 1 for a very long time. Mm. And so now that Audi... Is, is threatening to come into the sport as well with partnerships with Sauber, then what we could have here is a, a match made in heaven where Alfa Romeo maybe leaves the sport or maybe doesn't. We're not sure what's going to happen there. But we have a, a good platform for the next generation of F1 cars because the better you start, the better you'll end. And, and Alfa Romeo are starting from a, a very good platform. You know they they have got this this great opportunity now to continue that progression by throwing good money and engineering with Sauber a car that could be very very competitive by the end. I just hope it doesn't go the way that Haas went because I don't know if you could remember Tom Haas sort of came in um, and by 2017 had that excellent year of like 93 points and then in 2018. They went right back down again to the sort of 15 points or so. And I, I, I would not want Alfa Romeo to do the same thing and that Salva team to have the same problem. So hopefully this will be a trajectory that, that, you know, that will take them only to new heights. But with the new opportunities coming in from from other um, manufacturers such as Audi and, and I think you know, Stellantis want to come in and you know, Porsche is looking at it with the new engine changes and whatnot, that, that all these new regulations, then I think especially Bottas and Guan Yu Zhou, you know, who wants to be, both of them want to be catapulting 
you know, their careers forward. Bottas wants to be challenging for, for wins and Zhou Guan Yu wants to demonstrate how brilliant he is. You know, this can only be good things for them. But more importantly, on this form, Alfa Romeo Sauber is just going to be getting a lot of money by the end of the season in, mm. in just reward from their hard work. Absolutely. They've definitely played their cards right, as you say there, by siphoning off a lot of money for this year's design and sacrificing last year. And while we saw Haas change their driver pairing to two drivers overnight by bringing in Nikita Mazepin and Schumacher and that not working out, of course, there were naturally questions around would it work for Alfa Romeo, but slightly different, of course. You've got a, a rookie driver and someone who's been there for a while, and it's, it's gone very well. But looking at the age of them, 23 if you're uh, Gwen Zhou or 32 if you're Bottas, when you consider that um, Kimi Raikkonen went on to when he was 40, 41 years old, that driver setup and pairing is set for many years to come. It's a really exciting time to be an Alfa Romeo fan, really. And I think, as you say, with more external manufacturers thinking about getting involved with Sauber again, you could see the car go sort of above um, Alpine, uh, Renault and the manufacturers there. And even start knocking on the door of McLaren, for example, or if we're really thinking loftily here, the, the the big three. But it really does show, doesn't it, that when you play your cards right and when you, you know, invest in talent that also comes with a lot of money as well as getting an experienced head in, you really can can go well. And I just, I'm just i so surprised, really, there wasn't more fuss around Bottas and where he would go because thinking back to it, of course, there were other drivers locked into to different teams and they had their plans about how things would go. But... There didn't seem to be too much interest when it came to Bottas in terms of Formula One. And I understand, as I say, they're so into contracts, but for a man who can hold a candle to Lewis Hamilton, race so well with Mercedes for many years, I thought there'd be a bit more interest. But he's proving any doubters wrong, as he he loves to do after winning races with uh, Mercedes. I won't repeat the word for obvious reasons, but he's doing so well, and long way it continue really, because we're seeing, aren't we, why he was signed by Mercedes? That form that raw talent and consistency as well that he had at Williams and how he was able to bring that midfield team up to arguably above where it should have been. But looking at him so far, he's only finished outside the points twice. Once is when he didn't finish and the other time was P11. So if you're in charge or involved with Alfa Romeo, you can't really be asking for much more than that. Meanwhile, on the other side of the coin, we have mentioned the Mahas. Saturday was so good for Magnus and Mick Schumacher qualifying in P5 and P6, but translate that to Sunday and that turned out to be a P19 and DNF. Mick is still, of course, as we say, yet to score points in Formula 1 after one season and nine races and Haas sit disappointingly in P9 in the constructors at the moment. They are a point behind Aston Martin, 12 ahead of Williams who currently hold the wooden spoon. But after such a great start, it's not been too much an improvement on last season when it comes to the league table of the constructors. And former driver of the team, Roman Grosjean, says, and I quote, the team are becoming a victim of their typical downward spiral. And there's really no better way of putting it, is there? Oh, I, I don't know. Do you, do you fully agree with that, that they are just in a downward spiral? I think Haas are a very boom and bust team, aren't they? Ever since they came into the sport, they were either up there in terms of P5, P6, as we saw at the start of this season, if we're looking at Kevin Magnussen in Bahrain, for example, or they're down there in terms of retiring, in terms of P17 at uh, Spain, in terms of P17 in Canada. You know, I think they've, they have they lack consistency, and we spoke about that so much with Alfa Romeo and how well they're done with Bottas and to an extent Guan Yu Zhou. But Haas really, they lack that, don't they? And they show potential, and you say, oh, go on then kick on let's see how good you can do and of course you've got to go and look at that and say well that's partly down to the Ferrari engine that they have they've had four DNFs and I think all of them have been power unit related but consistency is something that has lack and we saw last season that they were quite clearly gunning for this season to be their one they'd sacrificed essentially a season to two drivers to bed themselves in we heard from Gunter Stein of the team principal that after a few races they're pretty much done developing the car because 2022 was going to be their year and when you look at their year as in the plan how it's unfolding 
it's going very, very poorly, isn't it? Because they're not out of reach from Williams, who'd like to go and score some points here and there, I went to Alex Albon, and I thought that Aston Martin were going to be down there, but they're now starting to have a good run of form, really. That's three times on the bounce now consecutively, owing to Vettel, they've got points. So, do Haas have a driver like that who can do that? Of course, Magnussen can, but more recently, it's been pretty dreary for them. So, I, I fear for them. I don't think they're going to be going in a complete sort of downward spiral plug hole motion and sink out of the sport touch wood, but they are very up there or down there, in my view. Haas have always played an interesting game with the sport because they've always from the moment they joined attempted to stick two fingers up <laughs> at the establishment and prove that they can just buy parts and do things differently mm. and do you know what it really really very nearly worked Yep. It was so close. As I say, if you go back to when Haas were on top form, like they ran in fourth place for a while, properly fourth place for a while at the 2017 Azerbaijan Grand Prix. As I say, this is why we watch these old replays because these things come into your head. And, um, and it reminds me of a time when Roman Grosjean and Kevin Magnussen were actually really on it. And, mm. and then you you remember that that was a real unique season where Ferrari were on top form as well because they they bought significant parts from Ferrari. And this year was supposed to be a new renaissance for Haas. It was supposed to be a hark back to that year, basically, when Haas chucked loads of R&D at their car uh, this year and, and tried to demonstrate that last year they got zero points because they put all their eggs into this year's basket. They got mm -hmm. rid of of Nikita Mazepin, which I think was the you know the right decision. That's something we've said on F1 in review consistently. We think it's the right decision to get rid of the Mazepin. Thank goodness yep. for that. And they brought in a, a fantastic driver in Kevin Magnussen. And Magnussen has had his own up and downs. He's you know he is an aggressive driver. When he was at McLaren, he was a, it was quite aggressive. Um, Kevin Magnussen and Nico Hulkenberg. There's no love lost between those two. They uh, <laughs> hated each other is the only way I can really describe it. Um, but he is a talented driver and he is absolutely getting has the points. And mm. this is what's annoying me. Unfortunately, at the moment, Tom, it is Kevin Magnussen getting all of the points. I mean, he's in 12th yep. place with 15 points. Even if Mick could get half the points of Kevin Magnussen that would give them another sort of seven points which would give them 22 points and 22 points in the Constructors Championship would get them into 8th place ahead of Aston Martin and only 5 points away from Alpha Tauri yeah. and I think that would be a brilliant result for Haas as it is they're in 15th place 1 point behind Aston Martin hmm and only in one place better than last year. And yes, they've got points, but so has Williams this year. You know, and, and mm -hmm. I know Williams had points last year, but the point is, is everyone is getting points this year. Everyone has made that step improvement. And so I feel like Haas really need to work out either a way to get Mick to start scoring points, because unfortunately, this is a, ruth a ruthless sport and you need points to survive. Or they need to find a way to get a new driver in to substitute Mick later on, maybe next year or maybe later on this season. I don't know. I don't know how relentless they're going to be. But, you know, if you're Gene Haas and you're chucking loads of money at this, mm -hmm. you want to prove a point. And Mick is supposed to be or was supposed to be a driver that would be able to demonstrate a good amount of, of, of skill and talent. And to be honest, I think Angus, if Angus was here, he would say that it takes Mick a couple of, a couple of years to get up to speed. And so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm saying that point uh, to substitute Angus. Um, and he's right. And this is the first year that, that Mick Schumacher has had this, you know, generation of cars and hopefully next year he'll be better. But I worry that he just might not be here next year 
because Haas are going to want to get some performance and, and make sure that they are not at the very back. They want to be at least, I think, seventh. If I was them, I'd be targeting seventh. Anything lower than that would be a big disappointment given that they got nothing last year. Mm -hmm. And there's so much potential, isn't there? I understand, of course, qualifying was wet conditions and they, they jumped the pack in many ways, not truly reflective and all that. But to get there is, is one thing, isn't it, in and of itself. And when you consider ahead of them, they have Aston Martin and Alpha Tauri. Now, particularly for Aston Martin, they're a team driving with one driver doing very well, Vettel, and another driver filling the seat, and that being it. You know who, Stroll. I mean, Alpha Tauri's are completely different when you consider that Gasly's doing rather well and Sonoda's not setting the world alight. He has good moments, but similarly up and down, not too consistent. So the chance to get seven plates is there. They have a good driver when you consider that, you know, of course, Nikita Mazepin was booted out of the sport, rightly so. They had to go and bring someone in to go and fill the gap. Magnussen, it's worked out as probably as well as well as... It's worked out as probably as well as it could have, realistically speaking, when you consider how quickly that all happened. But once again, question marks remain over Mick. And of course, the, the DNF came from the, the fact that his hydraulics failed. It wasn't his fault. I think going back to the reason why Magnussen didn't get any points and was down in P19, I think that was actually quite harsh and where I understand, of course, why Alpine got on the radio saying, oh, it's not safe that a part of his uh, wing is not properly attached after he um, bumped into Lewis Hamilton's show and saying they came rather close. I thought that was harsh, but that's how the cards have fallen and... It's another opportunity missed, but my point is the opportunity is there for them to get to P for them to get to P seven. The opportunity is there for them to go and fulfil their potential and, and and do as well as they they can really. When you consider that on their day they have one of the fastest power units on track, so the question, as you say, there is what happens to Mick Schumacher, and the danger is that Haas, because they're a team so reliant on Ferrari and reliance on on cash injections and reliance on how they finish more than any other team, I'd say they operate with the idea of short-termism being the most important thing versus long-term. Because if you were Alfa Romeo, shall we say, Alpine, Alfa Tauri, a fairly middle-ranking safe team that's always going to be in the middle, the order may change slightly, but they're always going to be there, you'd say, OK, it's not been a great start for Mick. We would have liked him to score points so far. He hasn't, but we'll keep him on for... A year, two years, so he does. Hash don't perhaps have that ability because, of course, the Schumacher family and the name has its commercial um, advantages, shall we say. There are, of course, other drivers who'd like to go in there who could bring a lot of money with them as well and perhaps more points. Giovinazzi being an example that's been linked. We hinted at it before. He's now being linked to the Haas car and we know how well he is with the Ferrari Academy. He is, of course, the reserve driver of Ferrari, Ferrari Power Haas. That link may go in his favour, shall we say. So it will be interesting to see, but I do stand by my feelings that to get rid of Schumacher, regardless of his underwhelming start to Formula 1, and to replace him with Giovinazzi, who has never really set the world alight, getting towards 30 now, we know what he is in terms of a driver, and we know what we get would be a backward step, not only for Haas, but for the sport. But that's just my view. In fairness, though, to Mick, because I, I feel like we are being particularly down on him, and mm. we're not, actually. We, we all privately are, are very very supportive of Mick and all want him to do very very well unfortunately we have to report his his results not <laughs> our hopes which is annoying um but our uh, has really let themselves down in Canada they put Magnuson for example uh, on a terrible terrible strategy because at the at, you know at the very beginning of the race he got that damage to his front wing and the front end plate was okay whilst it was sort of a bit dangly and then it started drooping lower and lower and lower and then it was going to become a bit of a safety hazard no one wants a bit of carbon fiber flying at their visor at 180 190 miles an hour so i understand why the fia stopped them to be honest i you know i know it's a bit controversial but you know if you remember we have had incidents like that before for example Azerbaijan 2017 when 
Lewis Hamilton had to pit because his um, his neck support um, insert was lifting up and nearly flying out. Apparently, Azerbaijan 2017, Tom, had everything going on in it. Um, <laughs> so, like, you know, other drivers have had to pit for weird reasons before um, and have had, you know, that happen to them. But what Haas then did in Canada was leave Magnussen out on one set of tyres for 40 laps, which just destroyed his pace. They didn't pit him under the safety cars or anything like that. You know, they really did ruin um, any opportunity to, to try and salvage something. So I don't know what was happening at Haas in, in Canada, but I, I think they let themselves down as much as, you know, that maybe Magnussen let himself down a bit by having that collision and, and Mick, Mick's um, hydraulics let him down. So it was all round a, a poor performance, but every team has those moments Every driver will have a moment that they really want to forget. Loads of ones come to mind. Like Roman Grosjean smashing his car into a barrier under, under safety car conditions. Or Yuki Tsunoda in Canada in the last race coming out of the pits and immediately going off the track and into a wall, providing us with our second safety car. Uh, you know, that in in a driver's season they'll often get a moment or two which they would really like to go back and change but the point is is those are supposed to be the exception to the rule Haas has disappointed themselves before by ruining their own moments in the first season of drive to survive it became quite iconic i think that gunter steiner the um team principal of, of Haas, said you know we're supposed to look like rock stars and instead we mm. don't look like rock stars. Um, he says something, <laughs> you might be able to fill in the gaps. And the point <laughs> is, is Haas has this reputation, I think, of never quite being able to to finish the job. But maybe, maybe they have to do a bit of a reset on their drivers. They got rid of Mazepin. And I wonder if Haas are still lagging behind Aston Martin now that Vettel is making it work and Aston Martin just redesigned their car to look like Red Bull. I wonder if they're going to be a bit more ruthless than they have been, a bit less patient with Mick. And unfortunately for us, we go next to Silverstone, a Grand Prix of circuit where they've not done too well. This will be round 10 of the Formula 1 2022 calendar. And after a much controversial race last time we were there, pretty much a year on, where Lewis Hamilton won for the eighth time and pulled three races clear of Jim Clark in terms of wins at that circuit. What are we expecting from Silverstone? Are we expecting there to be such a controversial race as last time? Are we expecting Mercedes to do so well as they've always done? It's worth noting you'll have to go all the way back to 2018 in the records book to find the last time that Hamilton and indeed Mercedes didn't win at this circuit. And we're told, seemingly like every race, that upgrades are coming for Mercedes. But I'm not too sure we'll see a repeat of that in terms of a Mercedes and Hamilton win. But what are we expecting from Silverstone in this Grand Prix? Tristan, who needs to do well? Who do you think will do well? And who do you think will uh, not get the rub of the green, shall we say? Right, definitely going to be a rapid one because we're we're approaching on time here. But Red Bull, going to win it. Ferrari are going to have a poor race. There is a lot of gravel at Silverstone. It's Carlos Sainz's last worst nightmare. <laughs> there are, you know, high speed sections. Magus and Beckers is gonna be really interesting to see, actually, given that it's they might return to being corners. Who knows? Mm. Um McLaren, I think, are gonna do very well. Lots of Aston Martin upgrades coming this weekend. Watch out for those. This could be Stroll's moment to shine. <laughs> I joke it's gonna be Sebastian Vettel if it's gonna be either of them <laughs> two doing very well. I think my bold prediction is gonna be that. This is going to be Aston Martin and McLaren's moment as well. I think those two could do quite well too. Well, very interesting. I think that uh, Ferrari will win this race. I think Leclerc will get P1. I think Verstappen will be P2, Sainz P3. And I'm expecting Alonso to have a rather good race. I can imagine him getting mm. P5 or 6. I don't know too much about why I feel that way, but it's just a feeling in terms of he did quite well at Canada. There's a bit of momentum there when it comes to himself and LP more generally. I think they could be one to uh, surprise the pack and maybe beat a Mercedes or two. 
And so ends episode 18 of F1 in Review. Thank you very much for listening all the way to the end of this episode, be that on your preferred podcast provider or on River Radio, be that live or via the Listen Back feature. A reminder that you can follow myself, Tristan, and our F1 in Review accounts on Twitter. And as we say there, we look forward now to round 10, the British Grand Prix, which starts on Friday. In terms of qualifying, in terms of British summertime, it will be starting at 3pm, as will the race on the Sunday. And for our listeners who are living or indeed visiting the UK, when it comes to this weekend, you can watch it live. That's right, live on Channel 4, with this, of course, being our home Grand Prix qualifying as well. And practice if you really want to indulge yourself in that as well. But it seems that's all we have time for. We look forward to looking back on what should be a rather spicy Silverstone Grand Prix. Until next time, thank you very much for listening, and we'll see you then.